Welcome to What If So What, the podcast where we ask what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real in your business. I'm Jim Hertzfeld. And I'm Kim Chopek. We're part of Proficient's digital strategy team. And today we'll ask what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? Coming out of the pandemic, where some organizations dropped everything and became digital just to survive, one thing was made clear. Every business would be a digital business. Ten years ago, digital transformation was born in a fire of marketing-driven, customer-centric zeitgeist of mobile, social, and omni-channel everything. For a long time, we were in a steady and, by pandemic standards, slow evolution of digital adoption and growth, which for a lot of companies meant just standing up a digital team that operated outside of the organizational norms. It was still novel, seen as a small percentage of the business that may or may not take off. All of that is behind us. We're seeing nearly every company we work with commit themselves to becoming a digital business. Digital first is not enough anymore. For many, that's just a front door to an unsatisfying mess of sneaker net and hold times. Digital only is the rallying cry to move forward, get ahead of the competition, and survive the next big challenge. But is that taking this too far? Which leads to the big question we have for this episode and for the season and for you, Kim. What does it mean to be a digital business? That's a great question, Jim. And I'll be honest, when I first heard murmurs of this, I'm going to call it movement in air quotes, I was highly suspicious. My initial thought was it was really just a cover up phrase for all those digital transformations gone wrong. But the more (laughs) we've talked about it and dissected the reasoning behind the phrase and kind of the ethos behind the thinking It's starting to formulate in my brain as almost the next step in a macro digital maturity model. Like if you call it digital transformation, you're already 10 years behind in your thinking. But that doesn't mean we haven't learned a ton about how to be more digital and how to evolve from what I'm saying, like that frumpy monolithic transformation to more nimble, sophisticated, sexy digital business models. But how do we get there, I think, is the big question now. Kim, I'll take option B on those two questions. Um, (laughs) I'll take the latter. A great point, by the way, about is this just another label for digital transformation? I I don't think so. What is clear is that the rules of engagement are not, and which is why we're going to explore this this season. So let's start with a few rules that are fairly well established. I think when you think about a digital business, the first thing that comes to mind are the usual suspects. Apple, Amazon, Google, sort of prominent Big successful brands either got their start with digital and digital a digital experience, or they've actually come to define the category. Right, right. And Kim, I just heard this a couple of days ago, where there's this notion that your iPhone or a smartphone is the internet. So that's crazy. <laughs> you know, that's crazy that's, to it, me. <laughs> it's it's it took a, mi- a bit to sink in, but it, it makes sense. It's kind of you know if, if this is all you know, sort of the, the fishbowl. Yeah, is the, is the ocean so. right? Maybe we're just old. Maybe, maybe. I remember, you know, so yeah, let's not get into, let's not go to the Wayback Machine. (laughs) Anyway, I think, I think a lot of people think of these companies, you know, if if you really don't know a lot about digital, but then there are companies that we think we know who are perhaps potentially a little more digital than we thought. And I actually would start with Amazon. Everyone knows that Amazon got started as an online bookstore, but the biggest advances they made, and I think what makes them such a powerful force, such a powerful brand is really in their warehousing, distribution, logistics, and delivery. I mean, it's pretty unsexy, boring behind the scenes. Of course, everybody probably sees an Amazon truck on the road these days. They even have their own airline, you know, and they're famous for their automation. And this is all made possible with digital technology. They're advancing things. They did drone delivery Mm -hmm. in 2016, still trying to work that out. (laughs) But if you look behind the scenes at Walmart, Target, Kroger, that's exactly where they have and continue to make major technology and digital investments. And I know from working with Kroger quite a bit in the past, you know, they consider themselves a distribution company, probably always have. Even Shopify, which is a, a digital commerce platform, you know, kind of a pure play platform, yep. is buying automation and robot companies, right, to drive warehouses, provide these services, you know. So so I think even the everyday big box stores, you know, are far more invested in becoming digital or becoming a digital business than, than maybe we realize. And so it's not exactly customer facing, but it's, it's a major factor in delivering the customer experience that people want, you know, in terms of availability, delivery times, returns, things like that. All the things we think of as great experience. 
But I think when you unpack this a little more, you start to see a lot of other things coming together. First, the obvious, lots of platforms, tools, mobile apps, websites, connected products. But I think when you when we dig in a little deeper, Kim, I think, you know, kind of preparing for this idea, you also see new practices, new methods, new roles and responsibilities, whole teams, whole new departments. Yep. I see new language. I see new culture. You see just a different way of thinking and philosophy. And these are all sort of both a byproduct, I think, of operating as a digital business. And in a lot of ways, they're also enabling uh, a digital business. And sometimes, let's face it, we've talked about this a lot, you know, they're just performative cargo cult waste of time and money. So there's a lot there. That's really what we want to focus on. So I think, Kim, this is the big question for you, put you on the spot, but I'm really putting us all on the spot for this season is our big what if, what if you could be a digital business? What do you think, Kim? Well, I'm going to come in with the so what, because this is, it's such a big topic. So what if you could become a digital business? So what if you accidentally became a digital business? I think a listener might be of two minds here. I'm going to go back to my initial thinking for a second. First, one mind might be thinking, this is digital transformation. This is what 70% of all organizations Mm -hmm. experienced failures with the first time around. What's the difference? But more importantly, I think from a business perspective, how can we avoid failure this time around in becoming a digital business or, or writing the digital transformation ship? The second mind may be thinking, as I alluded to earlier, yes, you know, this this is great. Digital business is just the slow, successful, long tail of this early transformation work. Like digital transformation was the sacrificial lamb. Now we're talking digital business. And we've made changes. Some, some things have worked. Some things haven't. But it's it's really represents the evolution of business. And we'll just keep doing what we've been doing. And I think we need to examine both lines of thinking in our so what through some examples of how companies approached becoming digital then and now. In other words, why are some of those digital transformation initiatives not panning out as intended? And what do we know now that we didn't then? And what are some persisting and emerging challenges in transitioning from transformation to what I'll just call evolution as usual in becoming a digital business? I I, I think that could be interesting. I'll give one example, you know, when we're thinking, okay, become a digital business. Like you talked about earlier, like if if everyone's connotation of a technology company is Apple or uh, I'm going to use Netflix, Spotify, it's like that propensity to say, well, I want to become a digital business. Let me act like a technology company. Let me emulate Mm -hmm. a technology company. So that initial take, like, oh, it's easy. We'll just think like Silicon Valley. We'll be agile. We'll implement Scrum. We'll roll out DevOps. You know, this fail fast mentality, a matrix organization, a flat organization, no managers. It all sounded really easy. But I think now, you know, fast forward to today in our aspirations to become a digital business, the real take here is product mentality is needed. You need strong product management. You need team empowerment. You need a much higher degree of collaboration. Change management is the foundation of all of that. And how do you share standards across an organization? So I I think it represents that real evolution of, oh, it's easy to what's not as easy. And here are some real things we need to address. You know, the challenges I think today continue to be in this example culture inertia, silo departments, lack of ownership, major skill and role realignment needs. You know, that's not different from digital transformation, let's say 10 years ago, five years ago even. But I think some of those challenges are better understood. And like you said, they've they've been given operational vocabulary to figure out how to move forward as an organization versus individuals. What do you think? There's so much here. First of all, I want to just applaud you for evolution as usual. So I'm going to start using that <laughs> this afternoon. Yes. Um, Thanks. No, I, I think this is so spot on. And I think there's still challenges, even with companies who have adopted sort of the product mentality, because I see product owners emerge, but they're really just the same BAs, right? They've had no training. Right. They've had no, right. there's no interaction. There's no change, you know, change in how do product owners talk to each other? Like, you know, and they just become... I'm not knocking any product owners, you know, but we've just 
they become documenters and it's just not enough. It's not sufficient. Right. So right. yeah, I still think even when you, you sort of adopt product management, it's not enough. But I think the idea of silos and the inertia around silos is, is huge. And I've seen a couple of organizations break this and it took some massive events, you know, in one case, a data breach at, a, at one client to really break the cycle, right? you know, and I hope nobody has to go through that. But we used to joke there that if you wanted to plan lunch, you needed to do an intake with the peanut butter team, the jelly team, the bread team, and the plate team. And, um, you know, that was, <laughs> you know, so terrible. Yeah, it was really, it was really rough. But, you know, they, they've adopted a product uh, notion, done a great job at it. I think other companies still have some, some work to go there. So I think there's a, there's a lot of unpacking of that. You know, what is a product in the first place? Is a product an autonomous thing? Does it have a limited use or value? Where does it begin and end? Does it have a life cycle? Again, roles and responsibilities are really important. So a lot of organizations have to go beyond, you know, scrum training <laughs> or hiring scrum masters. Right. So Right. That in itself is so disruptive. Um, and when you were mm -hmm. saying, you know, that data breach example, it's like an individual person. And there's been a lot of studies on this. What does it take for an individual to change their behavior? And typically it takes almost like a near death experience. Something so dramatic has right. to happen in your yeah. life to push that change. Right. You, you see that reflected in larger organizational behavior. And I think a data breach as unfortunate right. as it is, it is was unfortunate. has been the trigger, has been the trigger for a lot of companies to kind of take a step back and say, Oh, we did all this automation, digitization, under digital transformation, what did we miss? And it's all these things mm -hmm. that you're talking about. It's performative productization without understanding the real foundation that needs to be there, you know, as we become a more digitally mature. What's another example you can think of though, Jim? Well, I think you know, my, my takeaway, again, great advice on product, but you know, hey, I just act like a Silicon Valley, adopt Agile. I think another one we hear a lot is around mobile and mobility. Ah, yep. and, and there's just kind of a couple scenarios we, we've heard a lot. One is I need to digitally transform. I need to have a digital business. Therefore, I need a mobile app. Or <laughs> right. <laughs> we need an innovation. We don't have enough innovation. What can we do? I know a mobile app. And so this is where I think the numbers are something like, you know, 80%, 85% of customer journeys begin on mobile with, you know, a search or, you know, I'm, I'm, I see an ad, I see a Super Bowl ad. I, True, know, I, right. I, 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 I scan the QR code, uh, which was a yes. great ad, by the way. Right. So that goes on all the time. The, the penetration of smartphones is 80% or higher, I think, in the U.S. So there's no question about it. Mobile as a device is important, but when you kind of dig in and you really want to make that work, you know, you really have to think about mobility. Think about it as a, as a channel. Think yes. about not just the app, but is there a mobile web experience? You know, are you optimizing, you know, your content for search results on mobile, which is different than um, in, a, in a browser? Do you have a multi-device or a zero UI voice attendant? Is it in your product? Where does 5G fit into this? I have a great story I heard the other day called of a company called Mukao. And they are 5G applications. The industrial applications for 5G are amazing. And the most interesting ones to me are in agriculture. And so Mukao is this 5G hmm. connected device that's attached to the tail of your cattle, your cows. I'm not a farmer, so I'm out of my league here. And it tracks where <laughs> they are, what they're doing. It can even tell when they're about <laughs> to give birth. It's a great, I just love, I just love the name. Let's be wow. honest, Mukao. The, the applications go way beyond what a mobile app can do. And so I think, again, the challenge here is, you know, there's sort of this propensity to just react like, oh, I just need a mobile app. But we see a lot of web and sort of static single platform mentalities apply to the design and UX process. And again, not really understanding the scenario, the demand that the customer is thinking of. And again, back to mobility over mobile, you know, limited thinking of an app mm -hmm, on a mm -hmm. phone. And really not looking at the needs where, again, regardless of location, you know, situation that they're in, even if they're connected or not. So I think there's a lot more sophistication in mobile circles that, you know, doesn't really get out into leadership circles. So I think that's another another area that people need to think hard about as they think about their digital business ambition. 
I think that's such a great example, especially, you know, given our our date and time and recording here, we're a little over two years past the pandemic, where the knee jerk reaction for a lot of businesses was Yes, mobile, because we know our customers are on mobile. They're not going to come into physical locations anymore. So how do we serve that need? And you're totally right. In some respects, I think you could argue the pandemic really stunted a lot of the forward progress we were seeing in mobility and connected devices that gets away from the phone. Voice is a really good example of that. I would love to see this next evolution in becoming a digital business, like you said, more of a focus on mobility in general. Where are my customers? What is the right channel versus that phone? Mm -hmm. I wrote an article, uh, well, it was before the pandemic at this point, about what voice trends are up and coming. I'd actually love to go back and look at that and cringe at how wrong I was. (laughs) Not maybe. yeah, we'll link to that in the show notes. <laughs> maybe we won't link to it. <laughs> uh, maybe it's, but it's worth an update at this point because uh, you know, voice was the adoption was skyrocketing, and that was just one example. I think a lot of these, like I said, these connected device initiatives kind of got put on hold. I love that example of just thinking about where your customers are and thinking about literally physically how they're moving versus yeah, knowing they have that phone in their pocket and. Mm -hmm. How much more can we do with that? I'm not sure. Well, I know you got another one uh, on your mind, Kim, and this is this is another one we hear about. This is a very, I think, old knee jerk reaction and digital transformation for a lot of organizations that sold products and services, which there are a lot out there. Digital transformation in their mind was e-commerce and e-commerce lots of times was set up a website. And I think we continue to work with a lot of brands today that still, especially in the B2B context, still have a separate brand site from an e-commerce site. And that e-commerce site continues to be controversial for lots of different reasons. And I think rather than take a step back and say, well, how can we do this right as a digital business to evolve? They sort of double down on investing in some of the, I'll say, issues and challenges that they created for themselves several years ago. I think if you're approaching any kind of transactional or digitization of transactions today, I think what we've learned is it's not just a website. It has to be omni-channel, you know, customer experience rules in this case, regardless of the industry or vertical, you have to orchestrate that end-to-end journey. And I think, you know, we'll be talking to some of our guests this season that talk about even a lot of times your customer's journey starts off property in an area you don't even control, but you have to be aware of where that journey starts. So true end to end, which really now demands operating model shifts. And I'm going to come back to, again, the foundational need for change management and taking that seriously, understanding the change, understanding the impact of change, and then plotting out a map to mitigate any risks with the change and ultimately deliver on you know what you're trying to deliver through better change management. So obviously, the challenges now become team reskilling, digital operating models. Uh, There's still, especially again, in that B2B context, uh, channel conflict concerns. And that's, I would say, easier to deal with today as long as you have the right change management mindset in place. But I think this notion of just set up an e-commerce site continues to be a little bit of a Mm -hmm. knee-jerk reaction that I want to make sure we're fighting against every day. (laughs) What what do you think? I think it's a quick, it's a quick fix reaction as well. I I feel, I think sometimes like we just got challenged by, you know, an up and comer or pure play and we've got to just do something or we just have to be in the game. And I think, but people still to this day, especially as we see a lot more manufacturers go direct, you know, you've written and spoken a lot about direct to consumer. We love the notion of thinking big and starting small, but even then, you, you have to think about everything that goes around commerce. And it's kind of like mobile right. to me. If you think of mobile as just, oh, it's an app on a phone, then commerce is, again, way more than, from a customer perspective, the expectations of, are already way beyond that web, tra- <laughs> that browser transaction. Right. And, you know, and so, cause again, the expectation, I think the way we would define digital first is making digital not your first step, 
not your only step with the brand experience, but r- regardless of whether where the interaction is, and you mentioned that at the journey, whether I'm researching, buying, returning, getting help, right? There's a bigger omni-channel a strategy that needs to be in play as you you begin to add this one additional channel. When I think about things like you know, if I, ma- I made an order through uh, a dealer and I need to cancel that order, but that dealer's already gone to the manufacturer, the fulfillment team. And the dealer doesn't know what to do and nobody's talking to each other and it's, you know, yeah. it's a mess. I actually had an experience personally where I, I use one of those, um, I'm not going to name it, food delivery services, a mobile app. And I made the mistake, don't ever do this, of picking up the food because I was, <laughs> was going to be on my way, <laughs> on my way home instead of having it delivered, which is what 99.9% of the users do. Let me tell you, right? that was a disruption. <laughs> That wow. was a okay. yeah, I, I, that was an omni-channel experience gone terribly bad. Again, it's just thinking through what you're getting yourself into, you know, and then the expectations that you've just set up for your customers. So, right. but good right. one, but good one, Kim. I, I hear a lot about that one. I've got another one for you. Okay. So I think again, hey, just set up a mobile app, hire a scrum master and uh, <laughs> throw up a commerce site. Like while you're at it, build a data lake. We've got to be data driven. Mm. So I think again, yes. love this idea. You got to be data driven, hyper focused on analytics and course AI. And you know, we talked all about data is not driving just sort of the front end, but obviously a lot of the back end operations and logistics and so forth. So absolutely, you know, we're generating data and we got to use it. But there's so many ways to do this wrong. You know, you just throw up a data lake, throw up a reporting tool, we're good. A lot of enterprise companies know this. You know, they they are just dealing with so much data and they have there's so much at stake. You know, there are some very complex enterprise class major platforms around a lot of things. What we hear the term data fabric a lot. They start presenting lots of data governance issues. You gotta separate this is an old old problem, but data from insights. What does it mean? Yes. Yes. Do I need a data scientist? What is a data scientist? Then you've got requisite privacy, security, and compliance concerns to come with it. So we, we already know, and I think data, data people understand all of these challenges. We like to say data and content are the fuel for all this investment that you're making in these platforms, and you've got to do it right. I was talking to uh, Steve Thompson, our enterprise data architect, about this topic, and he gave me three more things that I think people really need to consider. One is cloud, and there's this, there's this tremendous overlap between modern data architecture and, and cloud native tooling. And I know that's very nerdy, but we wanted to mention that because it's actually a great accelerant. And there's a lot of cloud adoption. It's, again, I think the pandemic has, has helped a lot of organizations feel safer, you know, about their their security and, right. and, 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 and therefore their cloud ambition. So cloud is big. You know, the idea of trust, you know, how do you trust the quality? How do you trust the data? This goes into governance Again, more things to think about. And then you can't talk about data without the AI that you are eventually going to apply to it. And so how do you start to think about that with a AI lens in, in mind? You know, how are you going to deal with the unstructured data? How are you going to apply things like machine learning? This is obviously more complicated than it's, it sounds. It's more than a data lake. You know, it's also, you're going to run into, you know, there's not a single solution. There's not a single platform there's probably not a single cloud. You know, you're going to have to deal with multiple visualization reporting tools, and you're going to have to figure out AI and data science. So there are huge payoffs, uh, I, I, I think, uh, for this type of investment. But again, more than just a data lake. Yeah. And I, I'm going to go back to the difference between data and insights on this one. I think it's a great example. And a, in my opinion, an area where organizations continue to struggle and have not gotten better <laughs> since their big digital <laughs> transformation <laughs> initiative. So, uh, you know, I think about our, our discussion with Neil Hoyne, where he's very firm in his stance. You have enough data. Now figure out what you're going to do with it, what you're going to learn from it. So I think. Being data driven as a digital business, yes, there's a lot of infrastructure considerations and everything you just talked about is in terms of, you know, data fabric as a, as a new term and data architectures, modernization, trust, AI, of course, is, is a big part of that. But at this point, if you're not enabling your teams to derive real insights from that data, what are you doing? 
that's that next evolution in my mind of being data driven. If you haven't really paid attention to it before, you have to start paying attention to it now. And I think yeah. AI in particular is a nice augmentation of you know, how do you help your teams drive some of those insights? Because I think what we continue to see, the reality is, is that skill set is few and far between. And AI can actually help some uh, fill some of those gaps. Right, right. I mean, I think it is becoming a real I don't want to say exist, existential threat is too is too far, but the companies have that have figured it out are making huge gains, and that's why I think yes. it's got to be in everybody's strategic portfolio. Yeah, but related to enabling your teams, I think the last big example uh, I wanted to bring up was this notion of the hybrid workforce. You know, oh, I'm digital. That means our teams can you know work from anywhere, or let's just set up a Zoom account, or use Google <laughs> Office or G Suite, and everyone's cool. Read the book by the 37 Signals founder, and we'll figure out how to enable our hybrid workforce. And hybrid is really more of a post-pandemic term, I think. The real take today, and I'm not saying anything that our listeners don't know, we're dealing with the great resignation, employee experience as a phrase and a term and a practice is emerging. This notion of struggling between general versus specialized roles as you enable your team, you know, these are all... I think real takes when you're dealing with this, well, just spin up a hybrid workforce. I think right now, some big challenges we still need to overcome, again, date and time of recording, this notion of a hybrid workforce, hybrid meaning, well, you were working at home for two years, now we'd like you to come back to the office. There's very real resistance to that. It's a highly competitive market right now. The emerging workforce is, um, I will say, discerning, it seems to be, and what opportunities they're going to take relative to how they want to live their personal lives versus their business lives. They really want to take positions that align to their personal values. And this is all on top of how do you set up an environment that is hybrid workforce friendly? Do you have the right tools and technologies in place is one thing. And I think we saw a lot of organizations really bolt and move fast and sometimes struggle with those technologies over the pandemic but, and without those underlying processes and kind of social contracts between teams like this is how we're going to use it. I think that when we're talking about hybrid workforce and we're talking about employee experience, I think that's actually the next big frontier of being a digital business. We've focused a lot on customer experience. You have to focus on your employee experience to become a truly digital business. And ultimately, that will pay off in a better customer experience is my hypothesis. But I feel like that is uh, straddling old digital transformation and is going to be the mm -hmm. forefront of digital business. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think this, this is great, great advice for any company, whether you think you, you know, or have the possibility of becoming a, a digital business or not, right? This is just sort of social values of the time in a lot of ways. It's certainly something, it's a philosophy that we take in, that we've seen, I think, in very native and maturing digital businesses. You said bolt on, it made me think of it's much more like double-sided tape in some cases, right? because, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're like, is it really, is it going to stick? Does it have to? Right. <laughs> you know, I think about just all the digital theater that we see, foosball tables and unlimited LaCroix and the motivational wall murals. My favorite one, by the way, in a client was said no walls. It was painted on a wall. I don't, I don't know if that was intentionally ironic or not, but it's one of my favorites. There really is something real um, to this type of company and team culture that is unique to digital because it helps us focus on the most meaningful work. And it does work well, but I think the trick, and this goes for everything I think we just talked about, is know why you're applying it. Why do you need to take a product management focus? Why do you need to take a mobility focus? Why are you adopting a different stance on your data strategy? And you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. I know we'll have guests talking about this. We talked about, I'm going to give a little teaser here. You know, I test this. I run experiments on this functionality because I can't. It doesn't mean it's the most meaningful. And so I just think, you know, constantly, and again, theme of this whole show, so what? I think we've listed a lot of great ideas, a lot of things that we're seeing, but it's always about making smart decisions about what you can and cannot do. That's the essence of strategy for us. No shortage of ideas. I have a hundred ideas 
of those 100, which 10 matter, which three can I actually do? Right. You know, and, and I think that's how just a philosophy that we handle. And one of the reasons is kind of maybe kind of the now what is, again, think about this evaluation, but also know that you're going to be de- dealing with and confronted with nonstop change from here on out. And what did you call it, Kim? The the evolution? Evolution as usual. Yeah, evolution as usual. So I got to get that to stick. But change is constant. We all know that, but we got to live that. And so you know, we've got a lot of other challenges around the corner and I hope we'll explore them this season in the future. But, you know, where is cloud going to fit in? I think cloud is really taking off. Again, not a new topic. It's been oversimplified. Well, it's just a, you know, a server in someone else's data center. There's much more going on behind that than I think we know. I was in a conversation with a client the other day and and the honest question was, well, aren't we already in the cloud? Like, what yeah, is there to yeah. do at this point? And, and it's an honest yeah. question. I think there's a lot more when you think it, you know, the sort of the state of modern app dev and, you know, not just data, but the way we're bringing applications in and out, the way we're going to be linking organizations and partner organizations. I mean, yeah. Kim, we've, we've talked about a cloud operation around strategy and we've got some ideas there. Yep. You know, right behind that is blockchain, web 3.0, the whole sort of federation and decentralization of the internet. Don't forget about AR and VR which takes us to the metaverse. Is that really a thing? Is it going to take off? Where's AI going to take us? I think there's a lot a lot of questions we have to be on the lookout for. We try to handle some of them here. We'll be looking for them in our season and we'll be asking what the next white noise word is. We're looking for it. We've covered strategy. We've covered digital. We've covered innovation. We're sort of, you know, again, figuring out what it means to be a digital business. And by the way, we'd love some input and feedback on that. So what are we expecting then over the next uh, few weeks, Kim? Well, I think we want to talk about how do you evolve to be a digital business without panic pushing you? (laughs) So this season, we'll be asking our guests what they think it means to be a a digital business. Is it throwing new technology out there? Is it adopting the latest Silicon Valley trend? Is Silicon Valley even something to still pay attention to? If I put a hoodie and a pair of sunglasses on, will I be halfway there as an innovation? Or is that just another example of uh, old thinking? We really want to test out some ideas, find some new ones, and in a few months, get back to you on what we found out. And as Jim said, we want to hear from you as well. What are you doing to become a digital business? Let us know on the show page and keep listening this season as we continue to ask, what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? You've been listening to What If, So What, a digital strategy podcast from Proficient with Jim Hertzfeld and Kim Chopek. We want to thank our proficient colleague, J.D. Norman, for our music today. Subscribe to the podcast and don't miss a single episode. You can find this season along with show notes at proficient.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.